in the immortal style of Jerry Seinfeld and all hacky 1990s comedians, what's the deal with Metroidvanias? Because when you really think about them, they're actually kind of weird. The Metroidvania has been around since the mid-1980s, but has seemingly only reached the peak of its popularity very recently, more than 30 years after the original Metroid was released. They're not informed by any particular mechanics or perspectives like Match 3 games or third-person shooters, and despite being a portmanteau of both Metroid and Castlevania, basically none of the games that claim to be part of the genre actually have anything to do with Castlevania. It's all about Metroid, specifically one Metroid game. Super Metroid for the SNES. But I'll get back to that. In spite of this weirdness, I love Metroidvanias. Even though they share a lot of characteristics with other kinds of games, Metroidvanias have always been able to provide me with a uniquely compelling style of play that blends high octane action with more cerebral exploration. For those who don't know, the basic, classic setup of a Metroidvania is as follows. You start armed only with basic capabilities in a big open world. The catch is that you can't access most of it until you unlock new abilities that give you a new movement option or a new weapon that allows access to a new area. Rinse and repeat several times and fight a bunch of bad guys along the way. It's an intuitive, compelling gameplay loop that's behind a whole bunch of very different games that all, somehow, manage to feel very similar to play. So, when I initially set out to make this video, my intent was to try to get to the bottom of what the secret of the Metroidvania format is and what separates a quality one from an average one. The good news is, I think I've managed to crack it. The bad news is, in playing so many Metroidvanias in such a short space of time, I think I've discovered a bit of a problem with how we think about them and how they get made, and it's related to that original question of finding the secret recipe that makes the original Metroidvania so good. Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night have become so influential and so core to what we think of as a Metroidvania that they've begun to stifle the genre as a whole. Where the successors of Doom and Quake took the form of Half-Life, Marathon, GoldenEye and Unreal, which then inspired their own successors like Counter-Strike, Medal of Honor, Halo and Deus Ex, Metroidvanias are still pretty much drawing from that tiny palette of original source material, trying to replicate the success of Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night by basically just copying them, rather than pushing the genre forwards or iterating upon it in interesting ways. And when you really start paying attention, the similarities start to become very obvious indeed. For example, Super Metroid's second upgrade, and the first really major one, is the missiles, obtained at the end of your first visit to Brinstar. The missiles are a more powerful attack that consumes ammo and can open these pink doors if you shoot five missiles at it. This is pretty cool and offers a great way to associate exploring new places with a sense of power. However, a shocking number of other Metroidvanias copy Super Metroid's homework and barely bother to change a thing. Guacamelee's second upgrade after your cool luchador mask is the Brewster Uppercut, which can blow up these red barriers. Steamworld Dig's second upgrade is the Pressure Bomb, which can destroy tiles and obstacles your pickaxe can't reach, and Hollow Knight's first upgrade is the Vengeful Spirit, the only mandatory use of which is to kill these guys, who may as well be big, angry, alive walls. All of these abilities use some sort of limited resource, and to a greater or lesser extent, are all used as glorified keys to open up parts of the world. Taken on their own merits, a lot of the games I just mentioned are pretty awesome. My concern is that for all the titles trying to replicate the secret to Metroidvania design, they've gone about it in a pretty boring way. They're nearly all platformers with a heavy emphasis on fighting stuff, with abilities that more or less fulfil the same roles, and stories that engage with those same thematic ideas of parenthood, societal decay and isolation that Super Metroid and to a lesser extent Castlevania did all those years ago. Now, there's nothing wrong with copying what came before, but if we do it without recognising why those elements were included in the first place, then they won't be anywhere near as effective, particularly in a genre built around discovery. If you can instantly spot a stock Metroidvania barrier, and easily work out precisely what you need to bypass it, then the fun of getting that upgrade and then using it to open up more of the world is ruined. These runes in dead cells that let you open up new passages, or the colour-coded blocks I mentioned earlier in Guacamelee, pretty much exist just to pay homage to the way Metroid did things, but without knowing why it did those things to begin with. You've got to ask yourself, do they have these Chozo, sorry, Chuzu statues as a reference, or just because it's a clever way to not have to come up with their own way to hand out abilities? But why do people want to copy the classic Metroidvanias so much? Well. I think the best way to explain Super Metroid's enduring appeal in particular is to show you how the player's relationship with the first area, Criteria, changes as you play. 
You start after the intro here, the landing site. The music is tense and ominous, lightning crashes in the background, and there's nowhere to go but this dark, lifeless cave. This wall, this door, and these small gaps are completely impassable, funneling you deeper and deeper into Zebes. After this huge drop, you find yourself in a much more technological environment, also completely devoid of life. Smart players will recognise this as Mother Brain's chamber from the original game. You're wandering through the dead ruins that got left behind the last time Samus came over here and murdered everyone. After a short trip into Brinstar and the starting area of the original Metroid, you can pick up the Morph Ball and those missiles I mentioned earlier from these Chozo statues, which let you into a few of those areas you were made to miss back in Criteria. But wait. Suddenly, there are space pirates everywhere, and this big climb has been turned into an endurance challenge as you've now got to fight your way back up. Once you get into this area with the Morph Ball bombs, Metroid tricks you again. This Chozo statue is actually a boss. Ah! Super Metroid loves changing your relationship with the world as you play. New enemies will spawn in, bosses will surprise you like here when you fight Krokomar, and you'll be able to reinterpret old areas as you explore. Once you've been to Norfair and got on the Ice Beam, you can finally start travelling up instead of down, using these fellas as a platform. And when you do make it to this elevator after about three hours of gameplay, you're met with a familiar locale. The landing site from the other direction. Except now, instead of the music being moody and ominous to suit this mysterious new world, it's now triumphant. You've got Samus's iconic Varia suit, all the main weapons, as well as an understanding of most of the main areas. The game is congratulating you for completing your first round trip of Zebes. There are other moments of reinterpretation later in the game, such as the discovery of these creatures who teach you how to wall jump, an ability that you've actually had the entire time, you just didn't know how to use it. Suddenly, all those previously inaccessible areas like these big shafts you've been seeing, not like that, take on a completely new dimension, as you use this new knowledge to navigate the world in ways you previously thought weren't possible. Which leads me on to the end of the game. The finale of Super Metroid sees you getting faked out again by a Chozo statue boss that's already been taken out by the real star of the game, as well as fighting Mother Brain. We already know how that plays out though. But right at the end of the game, Mother Brain activates the Zebes self-destruct and you've got to run all the way back to your ship. This redefines criteria for a fourth and final time as you've now got to do all those easy tutorial obstacles on a strict time limit, fighting off a bunch of enemies in an action-packed blockbuster finale that's a far cry from the slow-paced intro to the game that took place in exactly the same rooms. Tense and spooky, exciting and lively, triumphant and relieving, and then action-packed and cathartic all in the same handful of rooms, just at different points in your journey. The actual mechanics of a Metroidvania, the unlockable abilities, the platforming and the combat, it's all in service of this core experience, of developing a bit of a relationship with the world and with a playable character that evolves and changes over time. It's for this reason that gamers in the 90s ended up grouping Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night together to begin with. SOTN has far more in common mechanically with early console RPGs like Final Fantasy and old school slasher world platformers like Ninja Gaiden, and the developers are on record as saying they were inspired by Zelda, not Metroid, when they designed Dracula's Castle. The thing that unifies the Metroid and Castlevania parts of Metroidvania isn't any particular mechanics or a shared design vision, but this theme of evolution and reinterpretation. You can include as many Metroid elements in a game as you like, but if they don't contribute to immerse the player in a reactive, organic world, then you're not including them for the right reasons. Ori and the Blind Forest, as well as its sequel, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, are a great example of this conflict between trying to copy the Metroidvania template and trying to make a game that actually feels the same to play in practice. The original game, The Blind Forest, hits all the core Metroidvania notes. Most notably the fact that you start off with few abilities and have to gradually unlock new movement options and attacks over time. The thing is though, is that these Metroidvania elements don't play nice with the fact that the game actually wants to be a straight up platformer. Until you unlock the bash ability, Ori's platforming feels simplistic and anemic, and the game really only has the room to fully open up and realise its potential right at the end. That's a shame because the platforming is really quite good. It often feels like Ori isn't giving you the toys it really wants you to play with, because if it did, then it wouldn't be a proper Metroidvania anymore. Instead, it blocks your way with a bunch of filler abilities like the Charge Flame, which is worthless in combat and only used a handful of times to open up these boring blue glowy walls and unnecessary blue glowy balls. Now, I know what you're saying. Ori in the Blind Forest does have some great moments, and you'd be right. I think the Jinso Tree platforming gauntlet and the Bash ability are absolutely genius. But we've got to ask ourselves, why are these everyone's favourite bits? 
For one, the bash is a platforming ability that's not really been seen in Metroid venues before, and the escape sequences in Ori take a relatively small part of the Metroid games and bring them right into the forefront. But more importantly, they both tap into that great feeling of evolution and change that serves as the true heart of the genre. Cleansing the Jinso tree, which supplies water to the land, purifies all these horrible purple swamps, opening up a massive array of new areas filled with underwater secrets to explore, and also helps you feel like you've had a measurable impact on the world. The Bash is even better, recontextualizing enemy projectiles into a platforming and puzzling opportunity as you ping off them to reach higher places. And around the halfway point, i.e. when you unlock Bash, the game really comes into its own, with you springing from enemy to enemy and transforming the environment as you play. It's really awesome. But because the game has to spend time with Metroidvania staples like spammy combat and gating entire areas behind very minor abilities, you don't get to spend nearly as much time with the best part of the game as you'd like. Which leads me on to Ori's sequel. If you'd like to skip any spoilers for some abilities and mid-game areas, I totally get it, uh, go to this timestamp, okay? The Will of the Wisps is another beast entirely, and sheds a lot of those vestigial Metroidvania elements to become the game it was always meant to be. Combat is faster paced and with less reliance on Power Beam-esque button mashy range duels, and there are way more opportunities to manipulate the world, like this bit where you get to drain the water out of a dungeon, or this bit where you rebuild the village and populate it with platforming abilities over time. But best of all, Ori and the Will of the Wisps abandons the Metroidvania tradition of handing out platforming abilities piecemeal by pretty much giving you all of your basic abilities in the first hour. This means that the game has way more time to fully explore all the fun stuff it can do with the bash ability and the new dash move, without having to arbitrarily wait for half the game for you to pick them up. There's also much more backtracking to early areas with your new kit to find hidden zones or progress non-linearly during the mid-game wisp hunt, and finding out there was a whole zone hidden underneath the water mill, for example, was fantastic. Because the game can rely on an early familiarity with these systems, it can expand on them in interesting ways as well, making getting all the new upgrades feel just as game-changing as getting the bash in Ori 1. The burrow turns these innocuous looking dirt platforms into floating speed boosters, and the light burst lets you create your own projectiles to bash off of. When I picked up these new abilities, my mind instantly started racing with all the new places I could explore, compared to when I picked up the climb ability about two thirds of the way into Ori 1 and thought, wait, why isn't this just in the game by default? And in Ori 2, it is. Compare that with Journey to the Savage Planet, which I really wanted to like, but it just had some of the most cookie cutter Metroidvania design ever. Double jump, big jump, several different varieties of those limited ammo explosives, Ugh. It was… fine, but because I could tell precisely how I was going to interact with the world from the outset, there was no evolution in my relationship with the game or a change in perspective, just ticking off boxes of abilities that all functioned in predictable ways. And in doing so, the game actually lost touch with the most important part of its Metroid identity. Games that copy Metroid and Castlevania are a dime a dozen, but for the genre to actually advance, we need more games that push the boat out and do something different, while still staying true to what made the originals great. To be honest though, those games kind of already exist, we just don't call them Metroidvanias. Toki Tori 2 fits almost none of the classic Metroidvania criteria. It has no combat, no platforming, and no unlockable abilities. The devs are on record as saying that they didn't even intend to make a Metroidvania, and yet Toki Tori 2 feels like more of a Metroidvania than most of the other games that tried to be one. The world is gated not by what missiles you have, but by your knowledge of how the world's systems all fit together. Like how getting wet allows you to kill these beetles, and how to avoid these annoying birds that like to pick you up by distracting them with frogs. Games like Outer Wilds or The Witness do the same sort of thing, and they're not even 2D platformers. But both games take the Metroidvania spirit of developing an evolving relationship with the world and giving it a new context. In The Witness, familiarity with the puzzles will not only give you access to new areas, but the more you play, you'll be able to spot more hidden puzzles nestled in the environment that you never would have spotted without first developing an intimate connection to the world. And figuring out stuff like how to navigate Dark Bramble in Outer Wilds feels just as groundbreaking a development as figuring out the wall jump back in Super Metroid. David Munich, lead developer of the fantastic Superland, says it best when he talks about his design philosophy surrounding abilities. Unlike in a regular Metroidvania, he says, where an ability can be used for one or maybe two things, I dismissed any ability that didn't have at least six completely different use cases. So the magnet will not only allow you to climb metal things, but at some point you'll be able to use it to erase a hard disk, for example. 
taking heavy influence from the likes of Portal, Superland is all about solving puzzles in unconventional ways using hyper-flexible tools. This way, rather than new abilities being useful in a single situation, and each one changing how you view the world precisely once, each one radically transforms how you navigate the game. Superland's second upgrade, following in the grand Metroidvania design tradition, is also a ranged weapon with a bit of a restriction on how you can use it. But, rather than simply being used to destroy red panels, it has a bunch of other uses. It has physics properties, it can be used to pick up these super balls, it has a laser function that can make an explosion, and it can even turn things red. Each new function you discover peels away yet another layer of the world. More and more, I'm starting to enjoy Metroidvanias that distance themselves from the namers of the genre and find new sources of inspiration, like the ones I've just mentioned, or even less ambitious titles like Yoku's Island Express, which takes the Metroidvania format and turns it into a pinball game. This simple twist creates a bunch of new and interesting movement abilities and environment designs only possible when playing as a ball. Or more accurately, I guess, a bug strapped to a ball, yeah, whatever. I think, without being shackled to these decades old games, but still keeping their examples in mind, these more adventurous titles can push the genre forwards and into exciting new places. Dark Souls, itself a cousin of the Metroidvania, suffers a similar problem. The game was so influential that it spawned a bunch of copycats like Lords of the Fallen that thought all you needed to be Dark Souls was a dark fantasy setting, slow combat, and punishing difficulty. What elevates truly great games usually isn't mechanical perfection, but an underlying, more abstract gameplay theme that informs all their design decisions. Bloodborne and, to a greater extent, Sekiro play very differently to their Western fantasy sibling, but they still feel like Souls-likes. Why? because that genre's identity is rooted in triumphing over seemingly insurmountable odds through mechanical mastery and knowledge of the boss's attack patterns, not Esther's flasks, Slow's Y-handers, or Lock and Key wall design. Hollow Knight, a Metroidvania, even manages to marry these ideas beautifully in its more combat-centric take on a typically quite chilled-out genre. Loving old games is fine, but they're not gospel. All the classic genre touchstones like Doom, Minecraft, or Dragon Quest are beloved to this day, and their innovations inspired a whole load of games. But that doesn't mean that they themselves can't be iterated upon. It's possible to stay true to the design goals of these classics, whilst also drawing inspiration from other places, and the result is usually a more interesting take than an inferior reskin ever could be. By understanding what made Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night work, maybe, just maybe, we might be able to make a game that not only does them justice, but inspires a whole new collection of games. Because, let's be honest, there hasn't been a good Metroid or Castlevania game in years, and maybe if we give the devs some ideas, they'll actually release one. Am I hoping for too much? Uh, probably. Hi, and thanks for watching the video. It's a bit of a weird one, made even weirder by the fact that I had to totally rewrite the damn thing because Ori and the Will of the Wisps turned out to be much better than the first game. I'm going to catch some heat for saying that Ori and the Blind Forest was average at best, but you know I'm right deep down. Anyway, instead of recommending a YouTuber today, I'm going to recommend this cool game by Sean Noonan. It's Mario, but an FPS, and a fantastic showcase of this guy's design talents. It's been really fun watching the development come along, and I'm amazed with the final product. If he didn't already have a job at Splash Damage, I'd tell all you indie studio people to snap him up. Check out the game, and please pay for it if you can. Speaking of which, normally this would be the part of the video where I'd order you all on pain of death to give me money on Patreon, but given the coronavirus pandemic, I'll say instead that you should really only give me money if you feel like you can. YouTube doofuses like me are the least of your concern right now, focus instead on staying safe and washing your damn hands. I will, however, give a special big thank you to all my top tier patrons. Seriously, your support is hugely appreciated, and they are Alex DeLonch, Asaran, Alno94, Baxter Heel, Big Chess, Bodhi, Brian Otariani, Daniel Metjes, David Dumatrascu, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Doodlehog, Evie, Ibathon, Jesse Ryan, Jordan, Joshua Binswanger, Lee Berman, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle1996, Mace Window54, Max Filipov, Mr. T with some tea, Patrick Romberg, Philby the Bilby, Prospero, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Strateger in Ultima, Yara Mirren, Zach Schuster, and Chow. Seriously, thank you for all the support, apologies this one took a bit longer than intended, and I'll see you all soon. Okay? Stay safe. Bye!